Okay, so in a previous video, we saw this half-wave rectifier circuit and with the inductive load, we called it. And we saw that during this time here, where this blue line is drawn, that the inductor current goes to zero. Now, this may not be something good because you're not transferring anything during that time, right? You may want a continuous current. Uh, for whatever reason, there could be a number of reasons you want the continuous current. But if this is not sufficient, then we need to come up with a way to produce a continuous current. And so what we're going to do in this video is we're going to take a look at how we can augment the half-wave rectifier to operate with continuous conduction. Okay, So we're going to have the following approach. We have still this. This is what we had last time, so this is nothing new. And I'm going to label this uh, D1, so that's a bit of a spoiler. And this is going to be Vs sine omega t. And I'm going to call this thing here Vd. This is obviously L, R. And then we can call this here Id. Okay? And so what I'm going to do is, as I said, there's a bit of a spoiler. I'm going to add a diode here, like so. And if I do that, then what's going to happen is when the voltage is positive, there will be conduction between the source and the load through D1. But then when the voltage goes negative, D1 will eventually turn off. And in order to keep this current continuous, this uh, diode here, which we haven't labeled, D2, will begin to conduct. Okay, so to make more sense of what that looks like, let's look at some waveforms, because that's always important. So this is what we would have in this case. Okay, now this is not to say that no matter what happens, as long as you put the diode in, this will happen, but you have to have certain characteristics and conditions met in the circuit. So the addition of D2 allows for a continuous conduction of ID, and it prevents VD from going negative, because it clamps the voltage. D1 and D2 cannot be on at the same time, though, because if they're both on, what happens? If they're both on, you have a sort of, you, you've basically shorted this, the, the, the entire source, right? So so if I, if I were to turn this on and then turn this on, the source is shorted, so that doesn't do anything. So that's kind of why this is placed backwards. Not kind of, that's exactly why it's placed backwards, so that when this is negative, it, it reverses conduction. So when D1 is off, D2 allows the energy in the circuit to be continuous by providing a path through which the inductor current can, they call it freewheel, right? So this is called a freewheeling diode. So this diode here is freewheeling because it's kind of just doing whatever it wants on its own. It's not being forced to do anything. It's kind of allowing the energy to keep going. So they call it freewheeling. They're sometimes it's called flyback diodes. They're called bypass diodes or catch diodes as well sometimes, but the name is irrelevant, obviously. So if L is large enough, then ID never goes to zero, right? So so it's not enough to just say, here, put the diode D2 in there. We're going to end up with some, um, some, some continuous waveform. It doesn't make sense. That can't be the case. So L has to be large enough. So what does L being large enough mean? L being large enough means L over R should be much larger than pi over omega. This is the condition uh, for, I guess you can call it, continuous conduction. Okay, So if you want continuous conduction, make sure this is happening. And what this is, is it's essentially the time constant. right? So you want to make sure your time constant is sufficient such that ID doesn't go to zero really quickly. Otherwise, you're, 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 the introduction of D2 is not going to do anything for you. Okay, so it's also true that D1 and D2 can't both be off at the same time because ID must be continuous. The current in an inductor must be continuous. So you can't have both of them be off. If they were both off, there's no path for the uh, inductor current. So if you replace this with an open circuit and replace this with an open circuit, you're just left with this branch here. So there's no there's no way that can happen. So the the two, you have to have one of them on, right? So that's what we're seeing. Here. So in this case, Vs is greater than zero, so we see D1 is on, right? And then here we see D1 is off, but D2 is on. So this voltage going down to zero, 
uh, and then what happens is this must be continuous because of these conditions and everything that we have in this configuration. So it forces this diode to turn on. So if you've seen the buck converter before, you know that in the uh, in the, the duration where the, the transistor is off, the diode is forced to turn on by the inductor current because the inductor current must be zero. And that's exactly what's happening here. It's, sim it's a similar thing, right? So from the waveform, again, we see that What's the average? We see that the average of this hasn't changed, right? So the average here is something like this for VD, I mean. So the average VD, so the average VD can be calculated in the exact same way as, as we did in the previous video, right? So this is one over two pi, zero to two pi, Vs sine omega t, d omega t, and this is equal to Vs over pi, right? So there's there's nothing different happening here. It's the exact same. This is behaving exactly as the single, um, or sorry, the, the half wave rectifier with with the inductive load, except that we don't see that little dip where it goes negative anymore, because as soon as it turn as soon as V S goes to zero, we see that the D two turns on, preventing the voltage from going negative, right? So that's another thing because that little dip where in in, in the other case where we saw this little dip where it goes below, that's going to introduce more harmonics into your system as well. So Technically, I mean, this is not a great situation either, but this is still better than this one, right? So you don't want to have this dip where it goes negative because you might have, it's never a good idea to have voltages uh, increase and decrease in very sharp manners like this. So this part's not the issue. It's the part where you, where all of a sudden the diode is forced um, to turn off and then all of a sudden the voltage snaps up to zero. So that's not a good thing. Anyhow. This is the maximum value of VD that we're seeing here, this this value here, um, independent of L or R, meaning you can make L as large as you want to uh, as in, for our filtering needs, right? So in a case like this, uh, this is the benefit of having D2. The issue in the other case is that this VD would depend on the value of L because the value of L would control or not control, it would influence how this current and this voltage are displaced, which would then influence how deep into the negative region this thing can go. And therefore you would have a dependence of VD on R and L. In this case, because of this diode, it's basically acting like the resistive load case, except your current is displaced, right? So in this case we have, um, we end up having, a, a, this is the benefit of D2 is that we, we're, be, we're acting like it's a resistive load, but really it's not. We're, we have our filtering as well. So, what you're gonna take it one more step further now, and we're going to say we want an output filter. We have this freewheeling case, but we also want to model this in a more realistic case, okay? So what do I mean by more realistic? So if you recall, Voltage sources are never purely voltage sources. They have some inductance. And that inductance could be intentionally introduced or it could be a, a byproduct of the system. But they do have some inductance. So now what happens when we have two inductors, like this? Because the inductor on the right side is a filter, so we're going to call this L. This one is something else. I'm going to call it LC. And it'll become obvious in a second as to why I'm calling it L. C. But essentially, in a system like this, what you end up with is you end up with slightly different behavior, and it's worth investigating what's going on here. So we're going to call this ID. I'm going to call this current here ID2. Uh, this current here we can call, I guess, ID1 if we want. And then we're obviously going to want to look at this voltage VD here. And that's it for what we're doing here. So, this uh, circuit here. This inductor is usually called the commutating inductor, or it, it's, it's an AC side reactance, sometimes it's called a commutation reactance, commutation inductor. But basically what this does is it facilitates commutation, and uh, as the name would suggest. Uh, commutation is, is just the, um, basically it's the current going from one diode into the other. Okay? And so unlike the half-wave rectifier, the purely this this halfway rectifier. The location of L impacts the behavior of D two. 
Okay, so the freewheeling diode is sensitive to this L. So the presence of L on both sides, not, not just the L, I mean like an inductor. So the presence of an inductor on both sides of this thing changes the operating states of this converter. And so this here, again, is a more accurate representation of what's happening. Or this could be intentional. Like I said, whether this is part of the source or it's int intentionally introduced, it has an effect on the overall circuit. And at the same time, you usually want to filter things. So this is a more practical version of everything that we've seen so far. Okay, so it's going to introduce a third state into the operation. And that third state is called the commutation state because current is going from one diode into the other. And so this inductor is responsible for that sort of behavior, and so they call it the commutation inductance or the commutation reactance, as we've already mentioned. So, again, waveforms, because without waveforms, we're basically lost. So we have here some slightly different looking waveforms than what we're used to. And I forgot to mention one, or draw one current here. I guess IL is the way we've drawn it in the waveform, so let's ignore ID1. ID1 is the same thing as IL, okay, and we can see that very clearly. Okay. Well, now we can at least. So, what's what? We see that VD goes between 0 and VS, as it did before. But you'll see that, that it kind of turns on at this time U, as opposed to turning on at 0 and being a purely sinusoidal waveform. And you'll also see that this IL is no longer... It's not. It's increasing in a different way now. So it's, it's sort of ramping up to this maximum value and then ramping down. So what's happening during these times is that the current is transferring from one diode into the other, right? So the current path, that is, it's going from one diode into the other. So you see that as this, as this diode current increases, so that's ID1 basically, you see that ID2 is decreasing during that time. And so if D1's current is increasing like that, then we know that what's happening actually is that's the time it's sort of taking for that diode to become to, to fully turn on and fully start conducting. So that's this sort of ramp up increase in this and then this sort of ramping down. And you'll also see that when this sort of ramps down like that, you'll also see that this ramps up. And so we're saying that the time that it takes to ramp up and down is being referred to as this U parameter that we're seeing here. Okay, and so we see that's the time that it takes for the current to reach its maximum or come back down to zero. And again, in this case, we're assuming that um, we're assuming that L is, or sorry, L over R is much larger than pi over omega, and we're assuming that I D. Uh, well, it's a lowercase i, isn't it? So let's assume that I D is constant. Okay. So that's what's happening under these conditions. And you can usually ensure that this is true under these uh, under these conditions. If L over R is greater than pi over omega, then I over, uh, ID can be considered to be constant. So we see that this is what's happening in this case. So if D1 is on and D2 is off, then there's no, um, there's no voltage drop across LC, right? And that means there's going to be zero current. So... When D1 is on, what's happening? When D1 is on, you have you have this conduction, right? This is the state when D1 is on, when VD1 has some voltage across it, right? So, sorry, it's the other one, this way. So when VD is on, sorry, D1 is, so when D1 is on, you see that the voltage across the volt, the diode has to be zero, right? So we see that the diode is on. But the reason that we don't see this part of the waveform at VD is because the, the diodes are commutating during that time. So that commutation period sort of kills the uh, that segment of the period. And you end up starting here once this is all the way at the top and once this is all the way at the bottom. 
And so you can make sense of that the whole way through for all of them. And this is also the same thing as VD1, which is true, which is the sort of the negative half cycle of what's happening there. Uh, that's the voltage across D1 when it's not conducting, right? Because a conducting diode would have, or a conducting ideal diode would have a voltage drop of zero across it, which is consistent with the fact that IL, which is the current through D1, is greater than zero for this time and constant, right? So this ramp up and ramp down behavior basically causes some type of issues as we see. So when the voltage goes negative, you see D2 turns on while D1 stays on, and they stay on both for a certain period of time, and because they're both on for this time, this voltage is zero. That's this time you're seeing here. And so this is turn this is D1 on here, and this is D2 on here, but they're switching states. It's just they're taking a while to switch states. And that while that they're taking to switch states means that this voltage has to be zero during that time. And that's the sort of commutation period U, and it's measured in degrees. And so we can determine what that is. But before that, why don't we look at what's happening during the commutation period? So the commutation period, like I said, they're both on, right? So if both diodes are on during the commutation period, you have this here. Uh, that's replaced with a short circuit. That's replaced with a short circuit, both ideal diodes. And because I'm saying this current is constant, I'm just going to replace it with a constant current source. So this is your constant current source, and this is the current ID, and this here is LC, and obviously this here is Vs sine omega t, right? And this current here we can call ID2, and this current here is obviously ID1. So we see that the two of those would um, equal ID in that case. So we can calculate what the value of IL is, I guess IL is what we had here, right? Not ID1. So I keep making that mistake, IL. We can determine what IL should be. So IL, IL of omega t, it's a function of the phase, is equal to IL of pi, or the value at pi. And then that's going to go from pi to some time omega t. This will be Vs over omega LC. That's the voltage applied to the inductor, right? So I'm trying to find the inductor current. To find the inductor current during the commutation period, and the commutation period what I'm, that I'm taking here is going to be starting at pi. So I'm basically taking this period here, right? So if I start at pi, there's some initial current there. And then you're going to have this integral from pi to some time in between there. I'm trying to find a generic function, right? So it's, it's some time in the middle. So technically, I guess this is incorrect. Well, not yet. I can choose a change of variables, and so we'll do that just to make sure it's technically correct. So this will go f to to find the generic function of what that what's happening between there. We find the voltage that's applied to the inductor, divide it by the um, re so reactance of that inductor, and we can multiply that by sine omega t because that's part of the voltage that's applied. But I don't want to use omega t because I mean that in the integral that's technically mathematically incorrect. You can't integrate from like you can't have an integral of x dx from 0 to x. That doesn't make sense. So I'm going to change the variables inside the integral. So tau is just a placeholder there. Uh, this is going to be d tau. And if you solve this, you know that il at pi is equal to id. And I know that because this, right? So we know that's at pi. This time here is pi. At pi, we know il is equal to id. We can, we can do that. And then we can solve this integral, which is a fairly simple integral to solve. We'll get this as Vs over omega LC, 1 plus cos omega t. And this is true between pi. So this is for pi, and omega t. And well, maybe I should move it further down. And so this is for for pi omega t pi plus u, right? So that's basically what I'm saying is this is what I L, this is the this is the function of I L between these two times. Okay? Now we know that I L pi plus u, so the value of I L at this time is equal to zero. Okay? And so using that information we can find out that u, 
is equal to cos inverse of one minus omega LC ID over VS. Now, how do I get this, this last expression? Well, let me take it one step further before I do that, because we know that omega LC is just X, X being the reactants, so I can call this one minus XC ID over VS. And this is U, okay? Now, this might be a little confusing because you're wondering what, what kind of just happened between the last step and this one. So, maybe we should make note of that then. So, the thing that we should make note of is IL of pi plus U is equal to zero. So what I can do is I can substitute, because remember, this is the expression of I L omega T. I can substitute pi plus U into omega T here, and then I can solve this entire thing knowing that this whole expression should equal zero. So substitute pi plus, substitute this into this omega T, set the whole thing equal to zero, and then solve for U and then you can find out what period or what duration of the period this commutation period actually is. And so that's very useful information because now we know how, if we're running this as a system in, in, in a practical setting, we know how long it'll take for the current to go from one diode into the other. And obviously very practical information. And you see that this is dependent on Xc, right? And so this Xc is the reactance of the inductor itself. And so that's an important uh, sort of thing. And this term here is often referred to as the, uh, it, it's, a sort of, it's a factor, so they call it the reactance factor, right? So the diode states where this is uh, sort of valid is up to uh, pi plus u, right? And then after that you have the whole cycle kind of changes and the, the opposite of the, what I just showed here happens. And you can do the exact same thing from 2 pi to 2 pi plus u, or from 0 to to you here as well, and you can get the exact same type of behavior. Um, the reason we picked this point here is because it's in the middle, we've seen that this is ID before that, and so on. So th since it's periodic, you can repeat this analysis in any sort of other point as well, it's just we chose to do this one here. And so one after this happens, D1 turns off and then D2 turns on, obviously up to 2 pi, that's this point, that's this time here. So at 2 pi, the whole thing kind of repeats again. Um, identical to what we just described, except that the commutating voltage will have a reversed polarity, right? Reverse polarity, I mean like the, the, the change of dir a current direction is the opposite. So in this, the current went from positive to negative, sorry, from positive to zero, and in this case it goes from zero to positive. Therefore, the, everything will be kind of reversed, but overall it's the exact same thing. So, if we want then to describe this uh, average, right, uh, because what's happened now is the output voltage depends on the load. And the output voltage depends on the load because we see that this Xc is now here. Uh, we see that this R is also here, and it also depends on ID, right? So ID is the biggest thing. So the fact that, look, we didn't assume any specific load here. We just assume that it's some current. But the fact that this current here is appearing in this U and this U is distorting our Vs, right? That means the average of Vs is going to change based on the value of U. Now, U is going to change based on the value of Id, meaning the output voltage, Vd, now depends on the output load current, and therefore output load, right? So th this is a concern, because the, as your load varies, your output voltage is also going to vary. Usually we want to maintain a fixed voltage regardless of the output conditions. So we need to understand how this sort of models uh, in a mathematical sense. So what do we do here? We look at VD. We look at VD average. And so this is VS over 2 pi. This is going to go from U to pi. And between U and pi, we're going to call this sine, let's say, omega t. And this will be D omega t. And so this integral will be Vs over 2 pi, 1 plus cos u. And this is just me solving this integral, right, like as it is. And again, this is coming from the fact that between pi, u and pi, so between u and pi, this voltage is Vs sine omega t, right? But it's only valid between u and pi. 
So you see that the, the time over which we're doing all this has now changed. But we're also seeing that it's periodic every 2 pi. That's why this 2 pi appears here. So I'm still doing this whole 1 over 2 pi times uh, the integral of the whole voltage thing. I'm just skipping some steps and making it look a little simpler. And so what happens here then is you get Vs over pi 1 minus xcid over 2vs. Okay, so this is the average voltage here, this thing. And so we see that in the case where this commutating inductance doesn't exist, this whole term disappears. Well, I should probably look at this thing here rather than look at that one. So when this is not present, if this term, if this term goes to zero, you end up with Vs over pi, which is the exact same thing as the regular half-wave rectifier that we saw before. So you see that there's very clearly an effect. And what we say that this effect is, is it's called, it's, it's basically called a load regulation characteristic because the load is now impacting the output voltage. So how the output voltage varies relative to the output current has to do with what we call load regulation. And so you may or may not have heard of that term in uh, electronics before. But essentially, that's what we have here. So the commutating reactant has the same effect on the output voltage as a resistor whose resistance would be Xc divided by 2 pi. It's not really a resistor, but it has the same effect. So what I mean by that is it decreases the average voltage, right? So the maximum value you can have for the average voltage is Vs over pi. As this reactant is introduced, it starts to basically say, look, it's almost like this is a part of the load because it's changing the value of the output, which is not a good thing, right? In reality, like I said, it's not a load because Xc itself would be lossless, so the inductor we assume to be lossless, but still it has some impact, right? So I guess the last thing we can say here is that Xcid over Vs is referred to as the reactance factor. And so in a future video, we'll introduce another type of rectifier, and then we'll, conf we'll compare the uh, reactance factor terms of this uh, well, not this, uh, of this converter with another converter. So I know there was a lot here going on because we had a, a fair bit of, uh, I guess, d d explanation and discussion and and, and, uh, and the equations aren't too complicated, but they're, I guess these, these behaviors can be a bit complicated. So we started off with the idea of this freewheeling diode uh, we introduced that, and then we looked at a more practical version of how we can implement all of this. So, obviously, the idea of the freewheeling diode is to produce a continuous current uh, compared to this voltage here. And so this freewheeling diode, as we saw, produced this output condition. The output condition in this case was the exact same as the standard half-wave case under a resistive load, but as we started to introduce the commutating reactants, or the AC side reactants, which again, is could be part of the source, could be uh, intentionally introduced. Regardless, if an inductor exists on this side, the overall effect is what we see here. And then we analyzed some stuff, and we figured out that we can, mo we can model this delay, I guess, or commutation period, as it's called formally. Uh, we can model this in this manner, and then we can also see that the commutation period introduces a decrease in the average voltage that the output of the rectifier sees. So I hope this was helpful. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. Like and subscribe to support the channel, and we'll see you in the next one.